Fantastic. ELO and Rockaria opening up at number two, Johnny Walker's Sands of the 70s. And our special guest this hour is Brian May. And we'll be talking to Brian about the movie, of course, and about a couple of books that he's got out. He's a very keen stereoscopic photographer. And it has two books, Queen in 3D, as well as Mission Moon. We'll talk about that and about the film and many other things after this. Queen and Keep Yourself Alive. That was Queen and Keep Yourself Alive, a first single, but not a first hit, um, <laughs> which is hard to understand when you hear it now, Brian, mate. Wasn't a hit, was it? No. Yeah. Well, we weren't in that position. You have to have a little bit of kind of status, I think, and, and a bit of a buzz going on. And we didn't have it at that time. We were completely out of the blue. But you played it. I know you did. And I, because my mum used to tell me, Johnny Walker's playing your record, you know. And at that time, it was hard. Nobody was playing Queen, you know, because they'd never heard of us. And what the hell was going on you know so yes it wasn't a hit but it paved the way and when seven seas of rye came out everyone was kind of prepared that something was going to happen and it, it got into the charts which was an amazing thing for yeah. us now a lot of people are enjoying bohemian rhapsody the film mm, are you yeah. pleased with it i am we are we're thrilled i have to be honest we are thrilled you know i'm thrilled at the reaction that people um, seem to experience. Everybody tells me they cry. You know, nobody ever tells me, oh, the film was quite good or something. They always say, it's amazing. It's the best thing we've ever seen. And we cried and we've seen it five times and stuff. So thrilled. Yeah, absolutely. But what was wrong with these reviewers who wrote NAF? <laughs> Do they not like music or what? I know it's it's very odd. Yeah, we got killed in the reviews. Yeah, and it's like history repeats itself. Really, it's very odd, isn't it? Because that's even in the film. <laughs> you know, the the public love you, but the critics hate you. Um, I don't know. I think some of it is a misconception. I think some people thought it was supposed to be a documentary, and it's not. So they start picking holes and saying, you know, this is compressed and this is in the wrong order. That's not what a film is about. You know, a film is about trying to find an inner truth uh, in a sequence of events, whereas a documentary is just stringing the events together and bits of film from the time. So I think there's a bit of a misconception. I think some people actually still hate us, which is fine. <laughs> some people hate Brian Singer, which is also fine, you know, and, you know, Brian Singer got sacked in the middle of the film. Um, but nevertheless, his name is on there as a as director for reasons which... I'm not even interested in. <laughs> now, the casting is wonderful because after a while, yeah. you're just convinced you're looking at the real people. You know, so even I feel that way. Roger and I are in there. You know, we did a lot of work in the dubbing. You know, we were in charge of sound, of course, the music. And um, yeah, after a while, you're looking at it and thinking, what did I do that only thing? Oh, no, it's not me. It's actually him. You know? <laughs> and it's bizarre. I mean, Gwillem particularly, I think. Who plays you? Who plays me is phenomenal. And I have so much respect and, and love for that guy. We spent a lot of time together in the beginning, just getting to know each other. And on the face of it, I was teaching him a few licks. He is a guitar player, but I was teaching him what I do so that it would be useful for him when he was... Um, doing the piece doing the pieces you know um but all the time he was clocking me he i realize now he was absorbing all my bodily actions and little quirks of voice and stuff so he gradually became me it's phenomenal even my kids were fooled they said dad you must have done his voice right i went no that guy is a great actor <laughs> <laughs> and uh, who found rami malik ah that's a story which I don't know all the ins and outs of. I, I just know that uh, Dennis, who's the Graham King's right-hand man, the co-producer of the movie, got it into his head that Rami was going to be a perfect uh, opportunity to find the right Freddy. And um, Rami did an incredible amount of work before he even came in. He really absorbed a lot of Freddy stuff. And he did a video of him just doing Freddy, which everyone was able to see. It's a bit embarrassing because um, they sent the video to us and neither Roger nor I actually watched it. I think, you know, we're not very good at internet stuff. You know, we're old school. So when we met Rami, Rami went, so so what did you think of my video? We went, um, <laughs> should we watch it now? Which is, of course, the most horrible thing to do. So we sat there with him and he must have been... Anyway, we loved it. And we just said, my God, you have it. Already you have the spirit of the man and you must be the guy to do it. Yeah, he was amazing yeah. uh, playing Freddie. And he, he's going around the chat shows and he's kept the teeth and had them gold-plated. 
<laughs> yeah, it's odd, you know. I mean, he went through an incredible amount. You realise there's some people on the internet putting Rami's performance next to Freddie's and you realise how incredibly close he got it, both off stage and on. You know, it's not identical. It can never be identical, but I think he captured so much of Freddie that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an astonishing performance. I think it's a performance of all time. And the scene in the film with you coming up the idea of We Will Rock You. Hmm. Um, are you pleased with that? Is that roughly how it happened or is that...? Yeah, roughly. I mean, everything is roughly, really, because, you know, you're compressing, I don't know, 20 years into two hours and so it can't be exact. It has to be... Things have to be rolled together to make sense and to make the point and some things have to be adjusted to be in different orders or else the film doesn't make sense. A lot of people have quibbled with that, but that's the way movies are made. You know, if you see any biopic, I should say, um, like Walk the Line or, you know, I, I now realise that it can never be the truth it, in the sense of the day-to-day -day if you'd been a fly on the wall. No, it can be the truth, which is something something more spiritual and more meaningful. You know, you were actually trying to get into what the guy was about, you know, what's in his head. So um, so that's what the film is, I think. And, and I think... If Freddie was around, he would like it, I think, you know, because it, it doesn't shirk any of his faults. It doesn't kind of gloss over any of the stuff that, you know, he would have been the first to say, oh, yeah, that's probably true. You know, I was a bit of an ass at times, <laughs> you know, as the film portrays. Were, but, were you ever an ass at times? Of course, of course I was an ass at times. I still am, you know. But it, I think he would be pleased at the way it portrays his relationship with his music, his, his relationship with Mary, his relationship with the boys, and eventually with the, the man that he settled down with. So no None of that is kind of pushed to the side. It's all right there in front of you. And I find people actually relate and, and understand Freddie in a way they never could from a documentary. Brian May is our guest and we'll play We Will Rock You right after this. That's Queen and We Will Rock You and our guest on Sounds of the 70s is Brian May. Now, I know you must have told it a hundred times about the Red Special. Mm. But it, it, it is amazing that you and your father managed to, to construct a guitar that was so good, mm. you just kept, you kept using it for years. And still do. Yeah, it is amazing. There's, there's a few miracles in my life, and that's one of them. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> was it kind of a hobby thing? You thought, let's see if we can build a guitar, and it just turned out better than you thought? I'll be honest with you, it was necessity. I couldn't afford one. There's no way I could have afforded a Fender or a Gibson. You know, we were a poor family, and um, I couldn't even afford the, um, the, the English copies, like the Hofners and stuff, you know. So we said, we can do better than that. We can do that. <laughs> Me and my dad had this uh, crazy idea that we could make one. And it would be tailored to what I actually wanted as well. So I think in some ways we were lucky. Some of the designs worked out. But also we put a lot of thought in, a bit of experimentation on the tremolo and everything. It has the first, the world's first frictionless tremolo, really, because tremolos have to return to pitch. Getting very technical with you now. And it has... Um, has acoustic pockets in it, which was completely new at the time. At the time, you had a solid electric guitar, which was designed not to feed back, whereas I wanted it to feed back, like Jimi Hendrix was getting it to feed back, you know, and I thought, I want that. <laughs> Didn't you tell me a story once that you were in a bus stop or something waiting for the van to pick you up for a gig, and the van picked you up and you left the guitar? Is that right? Or am I... Am I, I don't remember that. <laughs> it sounds like me. <laughs> no, I don't remember that. There was a horrible moment, actually, when our publicist at the time um, published a story that the guitar was lost and would people find the guitar, which was a dreadful mistake to make because everybody got upset and and kind of rushed to my aid, and then I had to tell them it was all not true. And that's one of the most embarrassing things that ever happened to me, really, you know, and I... I guess the publicist had the best interest at heart. He wanted to sort of make a story. But I hate stories that aren't true. You know, I, I think that's a terrible kind of abuse of your position. So, I w you know, I would never like anything like that to happen again. The guitar is still with me, thank God. Everybody told me I shouldn't take it to America. Mainly Americans told me I shouldn't take it to America. But I did, I don't know how many times now, all around the world. And she's still with me. It's incredible, isn't it? Hmm. Now, the other day on Sounds of the 70s, I did a thing, because um, I'm aware a lot of people are listening in sheds. 
Mm. doing all sorts of things on a Sunday mm. afternoon. In sheds. In I sheds. love it. Yeah. yeah. And I've got a, have, you, have you got a shed? Have you ever had I a shed? I do have a shed, yes. I love my shed, my potting shed, yeah. Yeah. And I spent quite a lot of time out there, yeah. Well, Dave Goodchild <laughs> from the Flatlands of Norfolk said, uh, I'm in my shed at the moment. I'm finally getting to the end of a mammoth 18-month-long project to build five, and forgive me if I mispronounce, Antikythera mechanism replicas which he says is a Greek 2,000-year-old astronomical computer. Hmm, like an astrolabe. I don't know this. It would be a way of calculating the, or predicting the positions of the planets, I suppose. Wonderful. Yeah, oh. well, well... He's making five? He's making, uh, yeah, he's making five well, of not them. Not just one of them, OK. Well, that sounds good. <laughs> Can I have one, please? <laughs> I tell you who would love that, Patrick Moore. You know, he loved devices like that. He had a couple of astrolabes. Was it he that got you into astronomy, or was it we just... Gay? Actually, it was. It was, Patrick, because when I was a kid, I used to beg to be allowed to stay up and watch the sky at night, which is at 10 o'clock after my bedtime. And, um... And my parents used to let me, and I just was entranced by the text, by him, his wonderful, boundless enthusiasm, and this vision of the universe, and by the music, you know, the music that started and ended it, ended it I found really inspiring, and I wrote to him as a kid, and said, can, can you please tell me what the music is? And he wrote back on his typewriter, famously, he, he, he wrote back to every kid, bless him, and he told me it was uh, Pelias and Melisande. Um, by Sibelius and I went out and bought the record and to this day that music symbolises the cosmos to me Which leads on to one of the projects you've been involved in because for a long time uh, you've been really keen on 3D stereoscopic photography Yes, indeed and You used to carry a 3D camera around with you I still do, Sunday. I can show you my 3D camera I'm never without the 3D camera Wow, This is a digital stereo and they have two lenses, like we have two eyes, to capture two instantaneous views of the universe, which will later be combined to make a 3D image. Of which there are many in two books. There are, indeed. So tell us about those. Yes, I must be crazy. In the year that we're launching a, a huge film, I'm launching two books at the same time. One is Queen in 3D, and it's the second edition of this, because I'm happy to say the first one sold out. But this edition has some extra pictures in which I took on the set of the of the Bohemian Rhapsody film when it was being shot. So some nice ones of Rami and the boys and of Roger and I on set. And um, the lovely Lucy Boynton and Bob Geldof, who came down to see the Live Aid set, he was pretty amazed. I mean, that set that they kicked off with was phenomenal. It was identical to the original Live Aid set. And that was the first uh, shoot that they did. They almost built another Wembley Stadium, well, sort of. Well, they, the they, yeah, <clears throat> they built the stage and the backstage, which was, I mean, it was spine-chillingly close. If you walked off the stage into the backstage, it's identical, all the same kind of half-eaten sandwiches were there and, and the period Coke tins and everything. But the stadium they built afterwards by a combination of very clever filming of certain sections of, of extras, eventually building it up into 100,000 people and then CGIing the whole stadium. It's phenomenal. I can't stop watching that bit, actually. Yeah, no, it works so well. Mm. And that, that is one of the greatest parts of the film. I think the, the, the thing that people come away talking about, my God, Queen mm. were great at Live Aid. I mean, some have called it the greatest live performance of all time. And in the film, you're sort of Queen and broken up. And, you know, you're going to get back together to do Live Aid. But in fact... Just to go to historical fact, you, you mm. just come off a two, two months tour, hadn't you? No, it's pretty much true, really. We hadn't played together for quite a while, no, and Freddie'd been off making his solo album. And we actually didn't have much confidence and we weren't getting on very well. Um, so, no, it's, I mean, the essence of the film is true. You know, we, I, it, it did a lot for us in terms of giving us back our belief in ourselves because. The, um, the concert was announced and we weren't on the bill. All the tickets sold out overnight, 100,000 or whatever, you know. So none of those tickets were bought on the strength of we want to see Queen. So when we were added to the bill, you know, Bob added us at the last minute, we thought, 
ah, this is great, but it's not going to be our audience. We've never played to an audience which was a completely non-Queen audience since we started. So going onto that stage was quite something. You know, we had no idea what was going to happen. Yeah, but the thing you did, did you, did you not, mm. was uh, you knew exactly how much time you got, so you rehearsed and rehearsed. We did. We took it seriously in... As far as you can take playing music seriously. Um, Bob said, it's a global jukebox. And you know how Bob speaks, you know. So we, t we took him at his word and we crammed all the hits we could into that, uh, I think, it, I don't know, was it 20 minutes? I can't remember how long it was. So we had an advantage, well, we had a couple of advantages. Firstly, we'd been previously to South America and played football stadiums, so we had a bit of a feel for how you do that. You know, it's not the same as playing Hammersmith Odeon. Um, so we had an advantage, you know, even though we were rusty, we had had that experience. And secondly, we had a great crew, you know, which I will always be, always acknowledge, you know, that the crew makes such a huge difference. Uh, so we had that, that kind of confidence. But we had, uh, our secret weapon was Freddie, who just had that knack of reaching out. And a lot of other acts went on and decided they, would, they wouldn't do what Bob said, so they played their latest single instead. And it just didn't work, you know, and I think at the time we went on, it was OK, but it wasn't what Bob had envisaged. So that's kind of in the film. I mean, I don't actually know what Bob said, but I know he was feeling, ah, this isn't quite what I had in mind, you know. And then when we came on and we did what he'd asked for and the money started rolling in because of that familiarity thing, then he was a very happy man. And he remains a happy man, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and presumably the group were very happy after that performance and the reaction to it. It was incredible. I will never forget the moment when they put all their hands together in the right time for Gaga. Now, Rock You, you could understand, because it had been out there and we'd played it, you know, but Radio Gaga, they'd only seen it on TV. They'd only seen the video in which, you know, we're on stage in, in this strange futuristic um, metropolis situation and everybody's putting their hands together with a double hand clap and whatever. We had no idea. Suddenly the whole of Wembley Stadium, who are not Queen fans, were doing it. So it, it gave us, I guess, endorsement for us, but also it, it was a sign of, of the TV age, I think, you know, the video age. It just, it emphasised what the power of that now was in the world. Because you made the video for Bohemian Rhapsody about uh, five or six years before MTV even started. That's right. MTV people always quoted us as a as a reason that they, they got started. Uh, we didn't really think about it at the time. You know, it's like, well, we can't go on top of the pops because we're on tour and actually we don't want to go on and mime this thing because it's going to be really awkward. Bohemian Rhapsody is so complex. So let's make a film. Let's make a video. And it cost £8,000. <sighs> I think a lot of that was for the uh, refreshments. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, a lot of work, though, doing bits over and over. A imagine. lot of work, but actually not not difficult work, you know, because we had it all planned out before we went in. It's like, you know, we planned the dive and dive the plan. We knew exactly what we were going to do. It was all done really quickly with pretty basic gear like sheets to make... Um, uh, silhouettes and stuff, you know, and a, and a very crude sort of um, multiple, multiply faceted lens to do those effects. You know, there's no electronic effects in that, except for the howl around, which is the most elementary thing you can do with a with a TV camera. So it was all just using existing cheap toys, but in a way which stuck in people's minds. And just going back to the recording of it, when in the film, if Freddie goes, OK, now we're going to do the operatic bits. <laughs> now, was everybody OK with that, or did that need some persuasion? No, there was no persuasion needed, because we'd already... We knew the territory. If you listen to that um, first album that we ever made, there's a song called My Fairy King, which is very similar in... In, it, in its style and its complexity. So we were very much used. The second album had these things called, you know, like uh, March of the Black Queen, which is immensely compl complicated, had all sorts of different sections. So, no, it wasn't a new idea, you know, and we had the Prophet song, which I was putting together for the other side of the album. So, no, nobody really turned a hair except like, oh, this is cool, you know, this is nice. And, and it was, you know, it was intriguing seeing Freddie's mind at work weaving this little tapestry 
And the lovely thing was the scene in the film of uh, being in the EMI office. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> we want this out as a single. No, it'll never get played, it'll never get played. Yeah, that's funny. I mean, there, there's a good example of trying to compress bits of history because it was a long, drawn-out kind of battle with all sorts of different people. And Ray Foster is a fictional character in the film because he just kind of brings all that together and you can do that in a couple of scenes and tell people kind of what happened. But, yeah, it was a big fight. And in this country, Kenny Everett was a big, uh, you know, as you see in the film, was it was a good catalyst. But, of course, people all around the world picked it up just because they felt excited about it and wanted to break the rules. And you yourself did. Yeah. Well, good old Kenny. He had more freedom, in a way, on Capital Radio. Yeah. Because he hadn't got that BBC hierarchy saying, you can't play this, it's too long. I know, and he actually did switch off his, his intercom while he played it the first time, apparently, which is funny. I think you... <laughs> <laughs> so they couldn't stop him. He was a lad, wasn't he? I mean, bless him. Yeah, he was great. He was. Queen, Bohemian Rhapsody, I guess is Brian May. The great thing about that, you never get tired of hearing it. Do Strangely you? enough, no, you don't. I don't get tired of playing it either. Cause it's, and it's, I tell you what, it never gets easy to play. <laughs> You've got to keep your wits about you. <laughs> yeah, and there's numerous times where I've completely gone off the rails. Everyone's going to go searching on YouTube now to find out what, what, I, <laughs> what I messed up. But, you know, it happens, you know, because it's not easy. And it's one of those things where it can't be... You can't busk it. You know, there's lots of things we play where I can go off on a, at a tangent and improvise bits. In Bohemian Rhapsody, no. If you come off the rails, you're not going to get back on <laughs> because it's, it's in a weird key. It's changing key the whole time. And, you know, I remember... Oh, no, I shouldn't even tell you these stories. But I've had some difficult moments with Bohemian Rhapsody. Right. Okay. <laughs> I'll tell you later. <laughs> Talking of guitar playing, I think it was Guitar Magazine poll. Uh, you're the second... Uh, greatest guitar player of all time. That's very nice. Who was the first? Yeah, I don't know who that was. It's got to be Jimmy. It's got to be Jimmy. Hendrix. I've had lots of people voting me into top positions. It's, it's very flattering. I don't believe it for a moment because there's a million great guitarists out there who I, you know, who baffle me. I got to be honest. A lot of musicians and people in in the world of music talk about your tone. Hmm. Brian, he's just got this tone that's just so good. Hmm. Now, a big grin on your face. <laughs> is that is that the Red Special or is that other secrets or what? What is it? It's a combination. Um, yeah, the guitar, you know, I had a vision of what I wanted it to sound like and it turned out to be very close and that's part of it. But a lot of it's in your fingers. I know that for a fact. I mean, I played with Hank Marvin, who was my hero when I was a kid, and he did a version of We Are The Champions. And so I went in the studio with him and there came a point where I said, why don't you have a go with my guitar? Thinking that he would kind of sound like me if he played my guitar. You know what he sounded like? Hank Marvin. He sounded like <laughs> Hank Marvin. I mean... Completely, you know, it was all in the fingers, and I was quite gobsmacked because that's a, such an incredibly unique sound. And I think it's the same with me. I can pick up another guitar, and I can sound pretty much like me. But with me and my old lady, the Red Special, as we call her, something special does happen. You know, it's just that extra icing on the cake, and and she does what I I want. And it's inspiring, and, you know, playing that guitar is still inspiring for me. And I think there's a link with my dad and a link with my history and everything, And but something happens. It, it, is, it is a particularly kind of... Um, there's an emotion to, to, to what happens when I pick it up. So it's irreplaceable. It is, but... Is it insured for a lot of money, but you can no, buy it's, another one like no, that? No, it's beyond insurance, really. But, I mean, none of us are irreplaceable, are we, really? <laughs> <laughs> in the truth, you know, and now we make those guitars. I, I, I've been through three different manufacturers, and now I, I am the manufacturer for Brian May guitars, and we sell a lot of them to kids. They they're not too expensive, and they do what I dreamed when I was a kid. So the guitar has spawned a few thousand, which are which are out there yeah. and inspiring a new generation. Good old dad. Yeah, thank you, dad. The other thing we haven't mentioned because we mentioned the books. Uh, there's the Queen in 3D, and there's also the one about uh, arriving on the moon. There is the moon eight. landing, Apollo 11. Apollo 11, the moon landing. Yes, it's the whole story of the space race, which to you and me seems modern, doesn't it? It seems like <laughs> after the minute, but it's 50 years ago, and 
Of course, it was a race. There were two sides to it, but we were only really aware of the American side at the time. This book, for the first time, pretty much is able to draw on material from Russia as well as from America. So you get the whole picture of the space race. And David Icke has done a lovely job of writing the text. What we also did, though, which makes this book a first, is that we went back into all the NASA archives and found pairs of pictures, photographs, which make stereo stereoscopic pairs, stereoscopic features. So no one's ever done, to my knowledge, a side-by-side -side, um, uh, stereoscopic, stereoscopically illustrated story of the moon landings. You know, it's the whole thing from Apollo... Well, from Yuri Gagarin onwards, from Sputnik 1 onwards. And uh, so if, it comes with a viewer, so you can put, put your viewer next to your eyes and then peer into the book and instead of these being flat pictures they will be 3D and you can go in there and it's like you could touch this footprint on the surface of the moon. Because there are one or two people in the world who don't believe we ever got there. Yeah, they're idiots. <laughs> I'm well, why, sorry. <laughs> why, why, if we managed it and we did get to the moon, why yeah. haven't we been back and built a space lab on there or something? It's a very good question. I think the truthful answer is that the impetus disappeared after we got there and the impetus was very largely even though it looked altruistic in from the lips of of john kennedy bless his heart you know we will do this for mankind it was about uh, supremacy in space it was about the vision that if you conquered space you would you would be a leader of the world you know it was military it was militarily uh driven i would say and on both sides, you know, for Russia and, and, and for America. And when it became apparent, you know, you, you then have um, Ronnie Reagan, who had a different philosophy. He was going to use um, nuclear weapons, uh, uh, you know, space-borne nuclear weapons. You know, the, the whole emphasis changed and there was no longer any need to go to the moon. So the money dried up. It's all about money, isn't it? So, yeah. you know, there was a few missions afterwards which were purely scientific, which I love, actually. After Apollo 11, they went on, and this is all in the book, and did a lot of fantastic geology, which was able to really solve the problem of how the Earth and the moon uh, were created. But, of course, there's no money in that. So eventually... Uh, there just wasn't the uh, the impetus. Now there is impetus. Now people are starting to think, well, there might be some commercial gain in this. So you've got private companies getting in there. Um, but, yeah, you're right, 50 years and nobody went back. Yeah. And you'll be celebrating, I think, next year. Is there a number of projects you're going to be involved in? Yeah, I'm celebrating it now, really, because, <laughs> you know, you, this is, you know, 50 years from... Back from now is is when uh, Gagarin and, and all those things are happening. Yes, I will be celebrating. Actually, I've got a great celebration on New Year's Day. Not quite to do with this, but it's it's the day when a mission called New Horizons will rendezvous with a Kuiper-built object. Now, if I sound like I'm talking double Dutch, you know what I mean, don't you? No. What's well, a, what, what was that word, object? <laughs> a kite, well, there's a... You have the Sun and its family of planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto. Now, this this spaceship, um, unmanned, it's, it's, it's a robotic spaceship, is called New Horizons, and last year, or the year before, was it, it flew past Pluto for the very first time. We got amazing pictures of, of Pluto, which no one had any idea of before. Um, and I was in the control room at the time, because some of those are, are my friends, these people who were doing it. And I was able to put together the first stereoscopic picture of Pluto, which is actually in this book, by the way, because it, it comes up to date. Now, what happened was this, um, this space vehicle was going so fast it couldn't stop anyway. It couldn't uh, land and it couldn't uh, orbit Pluto, so it carried on, but they were able to adjust its path with little jets so that it would rendezvous with another object many months later. So on New Year's Day, it rendezvous with this this piece of rock or whatever it is. Nobody has any idea what it looks like. Oh, but is, this, is this the one that they think might be a spaceship? I don't know if anybody thinks that really, but it, it varies in intensity, so it could be very irregularly shaped or it could be two objects. You didn't know that, did you? We're getting technical now. <laughs> they often say if UFOs really exist and hmm. extraterrestrials, why don't they land on the White House lawn? Maybe they're going to land in Brian May's back garden. 
I'd love it if they did, yeah. Do you think it I'm might... open to that. I'm very open. Okay. Do you think it might happen in your lifetime? <laughs> if there are benign creatures out there, yes, I would love to meet them. I kind of doubt it, though, because... Um, well, it's a complex thing, but, you know, it, it looks like there, there aren't any in our, in our solar system, and if they're not in our solar system, it would be very hard for them to get to us mm. because of the limitations of space travel, which are limited by the speed of light, as far as we know. It's fascinating. <laughs> mm, it is, isn't it? Oh, yeah, I'd love to see some little green men. Please, if you... Guys, if you see any little green men, just tell them to come to me, OK? <laughs> we'll give them a cup of tea. I need to have that conversation. <laughs> Brian, lovely to see you. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Johnny. It's great and to see you. Well done on the film. It's bringing... Uh, Thank you. It's the music and that Live Aid performance back in, into consciousness again, which is great. And lots of people are experiencing it. it for the first time, of course. They are. The great thing is it's getting to so many kids who really were only dimly aware of what we were, and they're passionately into it now. It's fantastic. So we're going to get a lot of new guitar players out of this, I think. And <laughs> so it can't be bad. Uh, there's a track <coughs> I want to play, a really good rocking track, a mm. uh, song you wrote, Tie Your Mother Down. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good old track, yeah. It's a very useful track because these days everybody knows it. So if I get up and guest with anyone... You know, other bands or whatever, they'll all say, oh, let's do Time Mother Down. You know, I've done it with the Foo Fighters and stuff. It's great, yeah. I, it, it's a boon to have in my armoury. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, great to see you. Thank you, Johnny. God bless. Fantastic. Queen and Tie Your Mother Down. And uh, Brian May's new 3D photography box are both out now. Uh, one is called Queen in 3D, the updated edition, and the other one is Mission Moon 3D. They're both published by Brian May's London Stereoscopic Company, and you can find out lots more by going to the website londonstereo.com. <laughs>